Hey, good morning. You can do better than that. Good morning. We had a great first service, and you're going to meet a guy named Frankie Charles, who's a friend we'll talk about in a little while. But this is part two of God at the Movies. And remember how we've gone through some kind of heavy messages for the last few weeks, and we're trying to get a lighter message that a little bit, you know, lifts the mood, lifts the mood a little bit. So I hope you enjoy today. Herc's got a great message for us, and I think you're going to enjoy it. Here's what I'm asking you. If this is your first time here, if you're new to Christianity or whatever you want to do, just open up a little bit. We're going to be here for about an hour and 20 minutes. Just relax and just say, okay, God, I'm here for the next hour and 20 minutes. Whatever you want to do, do speak to my heart. It's open, and we'll see what happens. Deal? Is that a good deal? Deal? Yeah. All right, there we good. Okay. All right, my name is Laura Campbell, and just like Tom said, we have an awesome morning planned for you guys, and we're so glad you joined us here today. Um, if it's your first time, we'd love to have a chance to meet you, so if you could head out after service um, into the lobby, we have an information center, and you can pick up a new guest packet. Inside has some information about our church that you're going to want to check out, and then two free coupons. Um, one will get you a free drink from our cafe, and the other one will get a free t-shirt for you and everyone who's here with you, and you can pick that up in the connect room. So after service, go out to the lobby and pick up this packet. Um, also, if you're a guest, you'll notice that we don't take an offering this service, and that's by design. We just want you to sit back, relax, and uh, like Tom said, open up your hearts to what God has in store for you today. Um, but if you do call Bridger home, you know there's joy boxes throughout the campus. You can give online. You can give through text. And we just ask you to give back what God has freely given to you. Um, and lastly, you'll notice that we don't take communion in this room, but there's a room right behind us called the Reflection Room. You can go through the bookstore, um, or you can go through those double doors to get there. And if you haven't been back there in a while, we encourage you to go back there, um, spend some time reflecting on what God's doing in your life. Um, you can receive communion, and then we have an amazing prayer team back there that would love to pray with you if that's something you're interested in doing. Um, also, we have a lot of important events coming up this week. So these are also in your bulletin if you don't hear all the dates that I say. But the first one um, is tonight, and that's our EDGE service. Um, so we're super excited about that. That starts at 6 o'clock tonight. Doors open at 5.30. Um, we're in a really important series for the students. This is called Love, Sex, and Dating. Um, Josh has given messages the past couple weeks. Tonight, there's a panel of students. Um, leaders that are going to be up here talking with Josh. Um, and it's just really important for you to come up here as well with your child, even if you don't want to let them know you're here. And um, you could sneak in the back, but just kind of um, getting on the same page of saying what we believe is important about those top topics. And then so that you can have those in conversations with your children. Yeah, I'm encouraging some of you parents to come up tonight, even if you drop off your teenager, they come up on their own. We had some parents the last couple of weeks that have come and just sat in the back and then left afterwards. But we're very raw talking about things that are very real with this generation and my generation and your generation as well. Love, sex, and dating. What's, what's that feel like? What's that look like? What does God's word say about that? How can we practically apply that? What are some guardrails we got to have? And um, Josh has been doing a great job with it. So it's a series, if you've got a teenager and you want to hear what we're saying, which is most likely the same thing that you're saying. If you want to hear what we think is the best way to live, uh, then we'd have you come there. Here's just a quick picture I want to give you about why we talk about it. You guys, you guys all love fire in a fireplace? Raise your hand if you do. Love fire in a fireplace? Fire in a fireplace is great. That's the place it's supposed to be, and it works really well. But if you take that fire out of that space and put it someplace else, it burns your house down. Isn't that right? That's sex. Right place, right environment, right time, right guidelines under God, phenomenal, great. Take it out of there, it can do a lot of damage. So we're very straightforward about that, and we'd encourage you guys as parents uh, to come up and hear what you have to say. Awesome, yep. Um, and then coming this week on Wednesday night, um, we have a night of prayer. Um, this is going to be focusing on getting into the season of Lent. Um, so it's on Ash Wednesday. So come up here. It's going to be from 7 to 8.30. There's going to be stations around where we can pray. Um, and then there's also going to be communion that night. So if you can get up here, this is this Wednesday night, February 26th from 7 to 8.30. Um, and then coming up for the women, in a few weeks, we have our next Thrive event. So we're super excited about that. Um, if you have not... Oh. You're super excited. They're not so super I, excited. I know. I need right. some more applause for that. Ladies, let's go. Um, so if you haven't gotten your ticket yet, please do so. They are going to sell out. They did last time. You said over 60% is already sold. It may be after first service even more. So make sure you get your tickets. You can get those online, um, and they are $25. So make sure you get that. And then um, in a couple weeks, we have baptism services coming up. So if you're interested in taking that next step in your faith, um, go to the information center, sign up. Herc will give you a call and talk to you about what that looks like, and then we'll get you signed up for your next baptism. Yeah, I want to end on one last thing. Just, you know, Herc's speaking today he's going to give a great message but you know he's my little brother 
And you know, for some of you guys that know, sometimes he sees this big brother doing stuff and it kind of makes him kind of feel bad. So we, we have a competition every month, not a competition, but we put out books to try and get, put books in your hands at good prices. So Herc put The Grave Robber by Mark Batterson, great book, and it's regularly 20, 25 bucks, and it's been on sale for $10. I took this Jesus Always uh, study guide that's been 25 and it's on sale for 10 bucks, and I've had to reorder this like four times. So he's feeling a little bad. He's feeling bad about it. So I th- said, you know what I'll do? I said, let's take Herc's book, which is $25, and let's make it $5. Five bucks. So as a sympathy vote... <laughs> he said, I'll pay the other five. So as a, as a sympathy vote for Herc, this is back in the bookstore. Buy one of these, read it. If you're not going to read it, give it to somebody else, and it'll make him feel better. Good deal? Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm going to say a word of prayer, then we're going to interview Frankie Charles. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for this place. We thank you that we don't have to call out, cry out, crawl, beg. You're here, and you love us. You know everything about us. You know where we've been. You know the wisdom we need to go forward. You know the forgiveness we need to move past our past. God, I pray to you today that uh, we honor you with what we do. And I pray today that we move closer to you through your son, Jesus. God, again, it's, it's, we're just nothing but grateful. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Well, Frankie, come on up here. Give him a round of applause. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So uh, this is Frankie Charles' um, first time in the United States. It's his first time in weather in under 60 degrees, if you can believe that. And uh, I remember he told me the other day, we're outside and it's like 28 degrees, it's early in the morning, and he goes, and, and uh, as he says something, mist comes out of his mouth, and he goes, he goes, smoke. he says, I have smoke coming out of my mouth, smoke's coming out. I said, no, that's not that. So just a quick story where we can move here quickly for you guys. I met Frankie. Uh, six or seven years ago when we were down in Haiti for a mission trip, and Frankie was an a, uh, interpreter. And right away we talked a lot, and we spent a, a week or so together, and I came to know Frankie's heart for Jesus and for helping his country. Well, if you know anything about Haiti, it's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. The average person makes $3 a day is what the average wage is. And uh, they have uh, a, a hard government, that's governments that's not very good to them, and they struggle to get water, clean water, they struggle for food, they basically eat rice and beans and so forth. And so as I met with Frankie, I said, Frankie, uh, how can we help you? And he said he was considering starting a school and uh, and if he could help with the church too. So at that point, we prayed about it, we did some things, came back here and and we started helping Frankie and we've been working with him for uh, quite a while now. So he names everything Oak Bridge in Haiti that we do, but I just wanted to share with you a little this morning that, Frankie, you started, how many years ago did you start the school? Four years ago. Four years ago. And he started with about how many kids? 30 kids. 30 children. 30 children. And now how many are in the school? 150. <laughs> yeah. And just so you know, they have, how many teachers do you have? I have 10 teachers. 10 teachers, and then you're the administrator. Yeah. And you have... A couple of people that cook, they kind of volunteer, cook, right? Yeah. And um, so he told me that uh, uh, his biggest problem is, is they need to pay all the teachers. Then the children there need to eat. Uh, yeah. Not enough food? Not enough food for the children, for 150 children. And not enough food from the family to be able to afford to do that. Yeah, is exactly. That right? Yeah. So he said, could you help? Now, just so you hear this, uh, virtually 100% of the funding for the school and the food is paid for by you. Yeah, and thank you for that. And so we're bringing him up here to try and do some training. He just got a visa, miracle of God, a couple months ago that we could get him here. Yeah. And uh, so we're going to show you just a couple pictures of of Oak Bridge Haiti, then I'll I'll share some other things. But look to the screens if you can. That's their logo for Oak Bridge School. Hmm. Next one. These are the children and their grades. You said kindergarten through what grade, Frankie? These are four grades. Four grades. That's one. And they all wear uniforms? Yeah. And this was, didn't you call me like six months ago during the summer and said they needed yeah. uniforms? Yeah. That's when yeah. everything that, we, that you give through your tithes and offerings, it goes to that. So, uh, next picture. That's the kindergarten one. Yep. 
That's the uh, school. That's kind of what it looks like, cinder block. Uh, yeah. Okay, continue. That's first grade. First grade. First kindergarten. All right, and that's the, what the teachers look like. That's uh -huh. the uniforms they wear. Next one. Same type thing. Yeah. Next one. They're writing. That's Again. the chairs they yeah. sit on. And he says they need help with curriculum all the time, trying to uh, mm -hmm. uh, do things. Next one. That's the outside. That's the gate. So they have a gate. Yeah, we have makes, a gate. That makes it safe yeah. when you come in there, and that's on the outside of the building. Nobody can come inside. Yes. Next one. Fourth grade. Fourth grade. And the last one. Next one. That's Frank at the Arch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But what's funny about it is he came in at night, and he's been spending the week with me, but he hadn't seen the city. And I, he's, their, their main city in, in Port-au-Prince is their main city, but it's just got smaller buildings. So he had never seen anything like this. No. And uh, uh, he had never seen snow. So yesterday, some of our people took him out to Hidden Valley. And, uh, I ran there. And it was amazed. So, you know, you and I have talked a little bit about uh, how they have a tough government situation. If you follow anything in the national news, you'll read where Haiti has got total government unrest. We haven't been able to go down there for the last year, year and a half, because it's been unsafe for us to go down there. Normally, we bring students and some, some of you down there to go visit and help. So he's able to get out, but they've had an inflation rate of about 25% in the last six months. So everything's gone up. So a lot of the people can't afford to buy food, food and the water. water right? yeah. And I said, so I'm here with Frankie all week. And I said, Frankie, tell me a little bit about what you've learned here. And he said, here in Haiti, we try and fill our bellies with food. We worry about not having enough food. And when you eat, you worry about eating too much food. Cry again. Hmm. And uh, he has a heart, which is what rang true with this, for Jesus and to help people, to actually be the hands and feet of Jesus, to actually take children and orphans and widows and take care of them. And so we brought him up here just to do some training and to speak to you. And, and uh, Frankie, tell us a little about how you feed them and, and uh, how they need food. At your Most of the children in Haiti, like my children and my orphanage, don't find enough food because they, they need food. And also, there are some parents, there are some kind of six, seven children that cannot fool all the children because they don't have enough food to give to them. Um, the biggest thing that I have in my, my, my school or in my orphanage is for the education and, and food. So yeah. they need help with that. I asked Frankie, I said, Frankie, how much would you need to give enough food to the people, the 160 kids and some of their family at this time period? And he said, we need $5 per child per month. So that would, we could feed them. So that's 160 kids times five, that's 800. Feed some other family members, that's 1,000. So what I'm asking you today is to be generous. 100% of what you give for Haiti will go to Frankie and the children, 100%, meaning that's, He's not taking any of it. Church doesn't take any of it. It's to feed kids. And um, I think we can do that. Can you guys do that? Can you? Yeah. So when you're, when, you're, when you're done today, I want you to go out and get an offering envelope and write Haiti on it. I want you to still support the church, but I want you to write to Haiti because that's what Frankie wants. Yeah. And I want you to help some of the kids. And I, I just want you to understand, you're changing lives. The church is alive. The church is, I told Frankie, I said, Frankie, isn't it amazing? They're in the same time zone we're in. So the same sun at 11.15 that's on us is the same sun that's on his children and the people that he serves there. Uh, Frankie also has some uh, orphans that he's helping down there via Oak Bridge. You can help with that. And our prayer is that God continues to grow what Frankie's doing, and we can continue to, to grow our generous hearts and help him as well. Deal? Right. Let's say a prayer. Father, we just thank you for the heart of Frankie, and we thank you that it's actually your spirit that guides people. It's your children that are, that are hurting down there. It's your children that need to learn about Jesus. It's your children, dear God, that uh, we have the resources to help. Father, I pray that you continue to uh, bless Frankie. When he gets discouraged, I pray that he gets encouragement. And I thank you for all the people at Oak Bridge who may never see the little kids but when they are generous, 
how those little kids will grow up, uh, grow up to be uh, healthy people that know that there's a group of people that love Jesus, that love them. Father, again, we, we, we thank you for all you've done for us, and, and we praise you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. I think there's one more picture. Do you guys have the last picture? Uh, I'm not throwing away the tech team around, but Kirk, can you pull that one up? That's Frank with my grandkids. And, and that's what I think of, by the way. That's what I think of that makes me cry when I think about Frankie with all the children he's watching. They're just like that. And if my children needed something, I'd pray there'd be a group of people that love Jesus enough to be generous. We can do that together, amen? All right, let's stand and say hello to one another and let's go to God in song. Jesus.
Awesome. How are we all doing this morning? Doing good? Kind of, yeah. Getting ready to enjoy the nice weather we've been experiencing here. We're in week two of this series of God at the Movies. And how many of you guys like Tom Hanks as an actor? Anybody? Did, you, did you know that he's the number one box office draw of all time? His films have combined to take in like 10 billion worldwide. Kind of amazing. So we're going to look at a film of his today, and it's um, called Sully, the real life story of the miracle on the Hudson. Just kind of a, a middle-of-the-road movie for him as far as box office success. $125 million in the States, another $115 million overseas. Um, but it tells us the story of this pilot named, named Chesley Sullinger, a.k.a. Sully. And, and he's, uh, he's taken off from LaGuardia Airport. There's 155 passengers on board of this U.S. Airways Flight 1549. And we're going to start off with a clip and see how they, they begin to take off here. View of the Hudson. I'll never get over how beautiful it is up here. Life's easier in the air. Yes, it is. Birds. Whoa. be a good idea just to keep your seatbelts on. You got one rolling back. You got both of them rolling back. Ignition start. Seatbelts, can I make sure you relax? Make sure your seatbelts are fastened. Seatbelts. What do you think that was? I think it was a bird strike. And we're going back to LaGuardia. Yeah. Get out the QRH. Well, Lots back. of thrust on both engines. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. This is Cactus 1549. We hit birds. Maintain 15000 Delta 331. We've lost thrust on both engines. We are turning back towards LaGuardia. Okay, you need to return to LaGuardia. Turn left heading 220. 220. Which engine did you lose? Both. Both engines. Soup? Yep. I have an emergency. What's the report? Both engines. What? Both engines gone. No thrust. All right. LaGuardia says go to runway 13. Tower, stop your departure, got an emergency returning. 1549, bird strike. He lost both engines, returning immediately. Which engine? He lost thrust in both engines, he said. Cactus 1549, if we can get it for you, do you want to try to land runway 13? We are unable. We may end up at the Hudson. That would have been a little frightening, wouldn't it have been on that plane? And, you know, I, I thought about Tom Hanks' body of work this past week and the movie Cast Away. Right? He's on a FedEx plane that goes down in the ocean, and he's stranded on a deserted island. He's had a movie, Captain Phillips, where, he, where he's the captain of a ship, and it was taken over by pirates. Then Apollo 13, I think that's my favorite movie. He's going, you know, heading to the moon. Something goes drastically wrong. They're not sure they're going to make it back to Earth without burning up in the atmosphere. So if we get nothing else from today's, from today's service here, uh, I would be careful about traveling with Tom Hanks, right? He's kind of got... <laughs> so. But anyway, they make the decision that there's, there's no way to go back to LaGuardia, that they're going to have to land in the Hudson River, so let's pick up the movie from there. Runway four. I don't think we can make any runway. Uh, what about over to our right? Anything in New Jersey, maybe Teterboro? 
Okay, yeah, off your right side is Teterboro Airport. A LaGuardia departure, got emergency inbound. This is Teterboro Tower, go ahead. Uh, Cactus 1549 of the GW Bridge, needs to go to the airport right now. Cactus, do you need assistance? Yes, bird strike. Can I get him in for runway one? Relight after 30 seconds and your master one and two confirm off. Off. Wait 30 seconds. Too low, terrain. Too low, terrain. Too low, terrain. Too low, terrain. This is the captain. Brace for impact. 500. Teterboro. We can't make it. Okay, which runway would you like at Teterboro? Go ahead, try number one. Number one. No relay. We're gonna end up in the Hudson. Too low, terrain. I'm sorry, say again, Cactus? Too low, terrain. Too low, terrain. Alright, let's put the flaps out. Put the flaps out. Out. Cactus 1549, radar contact lost. Uh, you also got Newark off you at 2 o'clock at about 7 miles. Got flaps out. 250 feet in the air. Oh. 170 knots. Got no power in either one. Try the other one. Try the other one. 49. Still out? 150 knots. Got flaps too. You want more? No, let's do it too. You got runway 29 available at Newark. It'll be 2 o'clock at 7 miles. You got any ideas? Actually, not. Right, what, what, what relief you could imagine then, but the rescue still wasn't over, right? The plane, they had, to, they had to disembark 155 people. The temperature outside that day was 20 degrees. It was a January day. The water temperature was 36, so they had to get people evacuated before the plane sank or, or before people just died of, of hypothermia. And they did their jobs well, and the Coast Guard came, and Sully remained calm, and, and all 155 miraculously survived that crash on the Hudson River, thus calling it the miracle on the Hudson. And instantly, now Sully was a hero. Right? He did the talk show circuit. Um, uh, in an instant, he became famous. I mean, 155 people he had saved. And from what I've seen, he was amazingly humble. He gave credit to the passengers, to his flight crew, to the first responders that day. Um, but the NTSB, they, they, they did an investigation like they do in all situations like that. And they entered the data from the flight and, and uh, they put it into their, ran it through their algorithms and they brought in test pilots to sit in simulators under the exact same conditions. And they made an, a determination that Sully had made a mistake, that he had unduly put the lives of those people in danger by landing in the Hudson River. They determined that he could have actually gone back to the runway, turned around, gone back to the runway at LaGuardia or to another nearby airport and would have safely landed the plane. So we're going to pick up the story now at this NTSB hearing. So let's watch this. Too low, terrain. 50, 40, 30, 20. Successful landing at Teterboro, runway 19. Multiple airports, runways, two successful landings. We are simply mimicking what the computer already told us. You know, a lot of toes were stepped on in order to set this up for today. 
and, and frankly, I'm, I really don't know what you gentlemen plan to gain by it. Can we get serious now? Captain? We've all heard about the computer simulations, and now we are watching actual sims, but I can't quite believe you still have not taken into account the human factor. Human piloted simulations showed that you could make it back to the airport. No, they don't. These pilots were not behaving like human beings, like people who are experiencing this for the first time. Well, they may not be reacting like you did. Immediately after the bird strike, they are turning back for the airport, just as in the computer sims, correct? That is correct. They obviously knew the turn and exactly what heading to fly. They did not run a check. They did not switch on the APU. They had all the same parameters that you faced. No one warned us. No one said you are going to lose both engines at a lower altitude than any jet in history. But be cool. Just make a left turn for LaGuardia like you're going back to pick up the milk. This was dual engine loss at 2,800 feet, followed by an immediate water landing with 155 souls on board. No one has ever trained for an incident like that. No one. In the Teterboro landing, with its unrealistic bank angle, we were not the Thunderbirds up there. I'd like to know how many times the pilot practiced that maneuver before he actually pulled it off. I'm not questioning the pilots. They're good pilots. But they've clearly been instructed to head for the airport immediately after the bird strike. You've allowed no time for analysis or decision making. In these simulations, you take in all of the humanity out of the cockpit. How much time did the pilot spend planning for this event, for these simulations? You are looking for human error. Then make it human. This wasn't a video game. It was life and death. So he's right, that's worth a few seconds. Please ask how many practice runs they had. 17. 17. The pilot who landed at Teterboro had 17 practice attempts before the simulation we just witnessed. The reaction decision time will be set at 35 seconds. 35 seconds, not enough time. We only had 208 seconds total, so I'll take it. All right, so you could go, they redo the simulation and, and the plane crashes as it's going back to LaGuardia. So Sully was, was let off. They knew that he had actually um, made the right decision. So a movie that I watched just a couple weeks ago, I didn't, I'd encourage you to watch a good movie, but, but we love good stories, don't we? I mean, we love, we love heroes, Spider-Man, Iron Man, Batman, Mighty Mouse, Hong Kong Fooey for those who are a little older, right? but mysterious people that come out of nowhere. We don't know how they receive their powers, but they do fascinating things. Well, this was a real-life miracle. 155 people saved. Sully was a hero. But I don't think he was really a hero in the sense that we think of with Spider-Man and, and those kind of people. So I love that line where he said, can we get serious now? So I want us to get serious now. I really don't think this was a miracle. What we just witnessed. I don't think it was a miracle at all. I think it was the natural response of a pilot who had been flying for nearly 40 years. See, Sully had gone through great training, right? He had studied the flight manuals. He had been in flight simulators. He had, he had captained several, you know, several different flights, taken off and, and landed and you know, all just you know, hundreds of times. He had trained and prepared. I think this was an amazing event with super high stakes. But I think it was the natural response of a seasoned veteran pilot. In other words, if you would have had someone who was just in flight school or if you had had someone who maybe this was their first commercial flight and they were all of a sudden faced with that same situation, I don't think we would have called it the miracle on the Hudson. I think we would have called it the disaster of flight 1549. But see, Sully, Sullinger, he knew what to do. He hadn't just messed around in the cockpit a few times. He hadn't just gone through the basics. He knew them. Uh, um, you know, backwards and forwards, but he had been in situations that had prepared him for that. As a matter of fact, we're told in the movie that if he had just followed the rules, step one, two, and three, that more than likely the plane 
would have crashed and we wouldn't have had the same outcome. So this was not a man that just knew the basics. He intuitively knew what to do when the geese knocked out the engines. And maybe you're here today and you're, and you're new to this Christianity stuff or, or maybe you're just exploring it. And I want you to understand that, that I think sometimes as Christians, or maybe when we're new to this, we think that, that Christianity is just about learning some of the basics, right? We, 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 there are certain songs that we're not supposed to listen to, certain forms of entertainment we're supposed to avoid. Um, we say certain things. We, we, we read the Bible a little bit, right? We go through the Old Testament, and there's some strange stories that, that we're told to believe, and then we get to the New Testament, and we know that that's where we're supposed to hang out most of the time, and, and then we learn some rules on how to treat people, and we get the basics down, and those are good, but that is not the goal of Christianity. That's not the goal of following Jesus, just to get a few simple rules down. See, God wants you to be the kind of person that, 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 that you've walked with him for so long, through prayer, through reading the Bible, through hanging with Christians, through serving, through being gener you know, generous, you, that, that you've sat in the flight simulator of faith for so long that you just, you just become the kind of person that does the right thing during the gray areas of life. See, that you have a peace and a joy and, and you have kindness and, and gentleness and love that's grown in you that despite the conditions that you face, despite what you might be going through, there's just something in you that's different. See, God wants you to have deep roots. God wants to work in you and to cultivate some things in you. When people are freaking out around you and the world seems to be falling apart, God wants you to be solid and just be the kind of person that responds the way that he would want you to. See, Jesus lived in a time where people, they knew the rules. I mean, they knew the Ten Commandments, and that was just kind of a, a, a guide, a table of contents for hundreds of other rules that they would have known. Good religious people, they would have memorized the scriptures, especially the first five books of what we have as the Bible, the Torah. They would have had that foundation. See, in the days of Jesus, that's kind of how you got your pilot's license. But then he comes onto the scene, and he starts to say some things that, that really were troubling to a lot of people. He kind of comes and, and critiques the law. And he says, I'm not, I'm not coming just to, to tweak what you've been accustomed to. He says, I'm going to blow things up. I'm going to make this brand new. He says, the old has served its purpose. It's pointed to me. It's shown that there is a better way to live, but it's also pointed out the fact that, that you can't do it. He says, it is, all, it is all pointed towards me. Now the kingdom of God is at hand in me, in my personhood. And see, they're troubled because for hundreds of years, they had known nothing else. But Jesus knew that the rules are going to fail, right? When you're in a gray situation, when, when nothing seems right, Jesus came to give us so much something, so much greater and better than just step one, two, or three. See, he's blowing up the system, not just updating the playbook, not interested necessarily in just giving us a better morality, Jesus is interested in each one of us becoming a totally different person, new altogether. See, Jesus is not just in the business of better, but of making things new. It's not about upgrades, not about modifications. See, we can get that from religion and self-help books, step one, two, and three, seven ways to do this, three rules. And I think, and I think those things can help, and maybe you become a little bit more of a, of a moral person. You might make a little headway there, but I think Jesus would say, that is not my primary concern. Jesus says, I have something so much better for you than that. I want to transform you. I want to make you into a completely new person. And that is good news, because I think we all know that we have some flaws, some, some areas in our life where we've tried hard, but, but we need to be made new. And the scriptures have said it in different ways from the very beginning. There were prophets that wrote hundreds of years before Jesus, and they'd speak to the nation of Israel, and, and they would be speaking into a specific situation, but they would also be pointing to another day, a day when Jesus was going to come onto the scene. And this is what Ezekiel wrote. He was writing about God and, and basically writing for God and says this, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Again, he's pointing to the time when Jesus comes onto the scene. So it's not just going to be an improved you, it's going to be a brand new you. John 3.3, 3, these are the words of Jesus. And he says, very truly I tell you that no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again, totally remade, rebirth. 
2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. This is the Apostle Paul a few years after Jesus is, is, is ascended back to heaven. And he's looking back and he says, Therefore, if anyone in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. See, again, Jesus isn't just trying to upgrade your morality. That is not what Christianity is all about. He is inviting you into a brand new reality. But if the old system, and especially thinking back in his day, if, if the old system is gone, if, that, if that's what you know, they had gone with for hundreds of years, and it, and it made sense. I mean, we worship this way, we act this way, we eat these foods, we avoid these things. People can grasp that. But if that's gone, then, then what's replacing it? What is, what, is, what is Jesus bringing? And fortunately, we're not left in the dark. In the Gospel of John, um, we're told that, that Jesus, it's the last night that he's with his friends and is before he's to be crucified. And, and, and we're told that his, his friend Judas goes and betrays him. And, and so we're said, that, said that, that Jesus is troubled in spirit. And for us, we might, we might blow over that, but I think this, the whole weight of everything is coming down on Jesus. He realized that now the time is at hand. So he's got these, these last few minutes, basically, these last few hours with his followers. And he's sitting with his friends, and you can imagine that the words that he's going to say are, are to reemphasize what he's been teaching them for three years, but these are very important, right? And he says, so this new system that I'm bringing to you, I want you to understand what this is all about. And, then, and I think he gives us a huge clue what this is all about in John chapter 15. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. He says, you are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. And again, I could picture his hearers, his, his disciples saying, wait a minute. You know, for hundreds of years, this idea of being made clean has been about the temple, about the high priest, about the sacrificial system, about what I do. And now you're saying that we are made clean because of what you have spoken to us about, about this, this new system. And Jesus says, yep, that's right. Not about what you do. You're not going to clean, get cleaned up this way. It's about, it's about this vine branch relationship. God has offered you a relationship with him. So again, they say, not about, about what I'm doing, about achieving more, about getting, getting better. Jesus says, nope. And he goes on in verse 4, he says this. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, he says, try as you might. He says, you may make a little headway, but ultimately if I'm not involved, if you're not connected with, with me, then it's going to amount to nothing. So Jesus, what do we do? And he says, remain in me. Abide with me. Stay with me. Hang out with me in layman's terms. But remain in me. And they say, rules that I'm supposed to follow, what steps do I take? I mean, these are the things that kind of have defined us. And Jesus says, nope, you want to bear fruit, you remain in me. And for those people, it might, it might not made a lot of sense. And I think for a lot of us today, this is kind of a tough concept to grasp. So maybe you're a little confused right now, and hopefully this visual will help. My daughter helps manage a nursery, so she gave me this tree that I can use. And, and it's kind of amazing, isn't it, to think that this thing started out like this, even smaller than that. Right? Amazing to think that this one day could be a life-giving, fruit-bearing plant, fruit-bearing tree. And see, when you really think about it, your salvation is a gift from God. When you came to faith in Jesus or when you will come to faith in Jesus, you get this. And he gives you something with great potential. He gives you a gift that can become incredibly strong with deep roots, but like this plant that will eventually turn into one day something like this. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen on day one. It might not happen on day 50 maybe even be a couple of years down the road, but then all of a sudden one day you look out into your yard and you see this tree and boom, you see fruit. Boom, boom, boom. You don't know exactly how it's happened, but at some point, almost seemingly dead little plant becomes this fruit-bearing tree. So see, again, when you come to Jesus, he gives you an opportunity. 
He gives you salvation. He gives you his spirit to live inside of you. He gives you something that has the potential to produce incredible character, peace and love and joy and kindness. But just like this plant, it's got to be nurtured. I mean, could you imagine if I take this and I just go stick it up in my attic? I don't forget about it, don't do anything with it, and then I come back to it, you know, a few weeks later and I expect it to be this. I'd be disappointed, wouldn't I? But a lot of people, a lot of Christians, a lot of Christ followers, sometimes we live out our gift from God kind of with that idea. So we ignore the process, the nurturing, this idea that includes prayer and, and, and scriptures and reading the scriptures, serving, being generous, hanging out with people in community, the, the people that are following Christ and, and being vulnerable with other people. See, we ignore the process that God has established that will produce fruit in our lives. And again, I think sometimes maybe we just got a misunderstanding of what this is all about. But we need to abide in Christ. That's our job, to stay connected to him. And when we do that, he cultivates and he works. And maybe not on day 100, day 200, day 400, but at some point, all of a sudden, you look at your life and boom, 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 there's free fruit there. So see, God's, God's provided a miracle. It's amazing. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was leaving the scene that same night that we talked about, he told his followers, he said, you guys are going to do greater things than I have ever done. That would almost sound blasphemous if it wasn't the words of Jesus. But he knew that he was going to send his spirit to reside in people and to work and to produce this fruit. Our job, their jobs, were to abide and to remain in Jesus. But see, I think some people, they give up because they think there's, there's no way that I could ever get to that point. I don't see that in me. We gotta be careful about this with students. I think sometimes people come and, and, and maybe it's from the church or the church family or, or a family member, and people start to say, hey, you know, you've been a Christian for a while and, and I don't think there's fruit in your life that should be there. You're a little behind schedule and, and, and maybe the people start to believe that and they start thinking, yeah, you're right, I could, I could never get there could never get there. And, you know, Jesus has some, some serious words for people that maybe are a little further along the journey with Christ. And he says, you know, it's not your place to judge. It's not your place to condemn other people. It might be your place to mentor and to challenge and to help and not to condemn. But I would encourage you, if you're one of these people that think, man, I can't get there. I'll never be like them. Never compare your beginning of your journey to someone else's middle. That's not what it's about. A few weeks ago, I was sitting over in the connect room. It was a weekday, and I was meeting with a couple. And uh, basically, they were there, and we were there, and we were just talking about how we live out our faith in the marketplace, in our jobs, and, and what it means to hang with Jesus. And during our talk, you know, I, I'm throwing in some Bible verses and telling some stories from the Bible. And, and at one point, this guy, this guy says, you know, I want to be able to do that. And I said, do what? And he says, I want to be able to talk about the Bible the way you do. And you know what I said? I said, well, that's funny because I've got an older brother named Tom and he's the pastor of our church and he says that to me almost every day as well. <laughs> I didn't say that. That wouldn't be very humble, right? No. As a matter of fact, what I said, I, I said, you know, basically I cheat. He's like, what do you mean? I said, look, look, I've got the advantage and, and you know, and, I, and there's certain passages that I'm familiar with that I memorize and, and I just pull those out and I use them when I'm talking with you. But I did say, I said that, but I, I also said, but you know, I have been reading have been studying, I've memorized some passages, I'm familiar with the Bible, read through it, you know, just, just tons of times. But it's taken me 40 years to get there. And I said, you can't just go from here to here overnight. Just yesterday, I watched a memorial service for Lois Evans. And uh, she's the mother of Patricia Shire, if you, you guys know her. If not, she's the wife of a, of a, a famous pastor named um, Tony Evans. And their son, Jonathan, was eulogizing the mother. She had suffered from cancer, and there was a lot of grief. And, and, but there was just tremendous joy in the midst of this grief as he's, as he's talking about his mother. And he said this. He says, you know, there are times when, I, when I'm just in life and I, I don't know what to do. And he's a pastor, and you could tell he was a great speaker. And he says, but there's gray areas of life, you know, where the geese have knocked out the engines. He says, I, I don't know what to do. And oftentimes I think, what would mom and what would dad do? See, it is important. It's important to be around Christians who are further down the road, who have been in the community of faith longer, who are, 
who, are, who have been seasoned by small groups and years of prayer and reading. They've been in the flight simulators of faith. And you think, wow, I'm not sure I can ever get there. But again, what Jesus would say is there's a process. There's a process to get you from here to here. And keep at it. Abide in me. Remain in me. And guess what? As you do that, as you do the things that we talk about, not about trying harder, not about doing more, but the habits that will keep you connected to Jesus, when you do that, then all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. Fruit will be in your life. I think there's sometimes people, though, they come to church and, and, and maybe there's a lack of authenticity and you're out in the foyer and you're saying, how's things going? And, and people just kind of give you this idea of, oh, things are great with me. God is good and, and my life is perfect and the kids are rosy and, you know, my wife and I get along and I'm getting job, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they say all this stuff. And it just doesn't really seem authentic. And you might even know a little bit different about them. And here's what I'd say to that. You know, first of all, not our place to judge again. But, you know, God is interested in producing real fruit in us. And here we need to be honest. We need to be open, authentic. God knows us, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And he wants to produce authentic fruit. So don't let that, don't let that keep you from finishing the race and continuing the course. And then finally, I think some people have walked away from the faith because the geese have knocked out their engines in life. We can put a picture up of this, this orange grove. Beautiful picture. But maybe in your life right now, kids are struggling. They've gone down a path that you would have never dreamed. Maybe in your marriage, the, the D word has popped up. Maybe you've even gone through a divorce. Maybe you've gotten fired from your job. You've been foolish with your money and your finances have fallen apart. Maybe you worry constantly and you were just frozen by panic, by anxiety, by depression. You were, in, you were in a spot that you wouldn't have dreamed you would have been in. Maybe, maybe you've done something that you would have never thought you would have done. Maybe you're in bondage to a sin that, that nobody else knows about. This is not the way that you thought it would go. Your life has not looked like that picture. But you know the good news? It was never supposed to be about a picture. See, our walk with Christ is a growing and real relationship. And I want to tell you this, sometimes there are winter seasons. You've had fruit produced in your life, and then all of a sudden it just seems like the, the tree is dry. You don't know what's going on. But I think the encouragement that Jesus would say, again, like he did in John 15, remain in me. Remain in me. I'm working. I'm cultivating. Your job is to stay connected to me because spring is on the way. And I'm sorry here if you're here today and you've heard this a bunch of times. But this is my story, and, 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 and there are new people each week, so if you've heard this a bunch of times, tough. Bear with me. I'm speaking, okay? So, but in the summer of 2013, had a total nervous breakdown. Massive worry, anxiety. I could not control my mind. I was put out of commission. I thought I was going crazy. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't read. The only prayer that I could pray was help me. I was in a spot that I never thought I would be in. I was in the winter of life. The geese had knocked out my engines. And fortunately, I had good friends, great friends, a great church family, a great, a great family, and, and I remained in Christ. And I know that God did not cause my breakdown. See, there were areas of my life that needed to be resurrected, that needed to be made new. And while I'm still a work in progress, God did amazing things through that time period and still has. As a matter of fact, I would say that that area of my life has produced more fruit in my life for my family, for the church, for myself than I could have ever imagined. Never want to go through that experience again. It was horrible. It was, it was hard. But I'm thankful for it. Only God, only God takes your greatest weakness and turns it into your greatest strength. This is what happens to fake fruit, by the way. It falls off, right? <laughs> but you know, it's natural for our God. I mean, when you think of the cross, he sends his son the most horrific act ever imaginable. The rescuer comes down, the creator comes down, and he is killed by the ones that he came to save. But God flipped that totally upside down in the most cruel, unjust, worst possible outcome became the redemption of mankind, the greatest victory in the history of the world. 
That's what he does. That's our God, and that's good news. And he's amazing. And see, this system, this idea that he came, this abiding in Christ, following Jesus, remaining in him, it makes sense. It deals with reality. We're broken. You're broken. I'm broken. Try as you might. You might make a little headway, but yet you, 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 you can't live up to the standards. And Jesus is the rescuer. He's the true hero. And he offers salvation and he takes up residence. And he says, I'm going to make you new. Let's get this process started. He says, you're to be a good branch. That's your job. Hang with me. Stay connected to me and I'll do my part. And you will bear fruit. I will make you new. And that's awesome. But it doesn't even stop there. I told you I listened to that to that eulogy from Jonathan Edwards Evans and he and he spoke at his mother's funeral and, and again he was grateful for all that they had done but he said this and he asked this question among the people and it really turned into a church service and just powerful I'd encourage you to go watch it but he says he asked this question he says how do you know that you're serving God ask that to the people in the audience he says how do you know that you're serving God and again speaking of his mother he says you know you're serving God when somebody is impacted so this idea of the, the fruit that's in our life, it's good for us. Produces fruit in me, produces fruit in you. But also part of our fruit is the impact we have on other people. Five or six years ago, I was meeting with a guy uh, up here at church. And, and again, the geese had knocked out his engines. And he had made some choices, done some stupid stuff. Uh, and his family was broken. And he wasn't sure if his marriage was going to make it. But he came, he confessed, he repented. And then he got serious about hanging out with Jesus, about following Christ, about remaining in him. And soon afterwards, he was baptized. And again, here's a plug. We have baptism services regularly. And, and he didn't get himself cleaned up first before he got baptized. Came just as he was. Because as a matter of fact, when we were baptized, basically what we were declaring is, I can't clean myself up. I need a savior. I need a rescuer. But he knew that that was part of the process to humble himself. And he was baptized. And I know that he, he attends, he reads scriptures, he prays, he's involved in authentic community, he serves, he lives out his faith at work. And he's by no means perfect, but over these last four or five years, he has been abiding and remaining in Christ. And guess what? I've watched it firsthand. Boom, boom, boom. The fruit is appearing in his life. And he recently sat down just a couple weeks ago with Josh and some other people over at the city church. And he was kind of leading them in a devotional. And, and he says, you know what? I've got a group of people that I pray for, like, like 10 people that I pray for every day that are on a list. And he says, every week, I don't fail to invite them to church. Right? Because he's abiding in Christ, his mind's right. And he was super pumped on this morning because he'd gotten eight, eight texts saying that eight different people were going to come to that service that morning. Only one or two ended up showing up. But he keeps praying. And he keeps asking. And I guess what I'm saying, if we abide in Christ, all of us, think if we all had a list of eight or ten people that we are praying for, and we don't just stop there, we ask and we invite. And he said he did that because he loves these people and he wants them to know the Jesus that has changed his life and made him new. So see, God wants to produce fruit in you, but then he also wants to, to produce fruit in other people through you and the fruit that you have will impact them and then maybe most importantly when we abide in Christ when we bear fruit it brings honor and glory to our Heavenly Father John 15 8 says this this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples see God is faithful you are not gonna get from here to here in day one there's a process there's a church. There are practices that we, that we get into that help us stay connected to the one who cultivates and works the soil and the roots so that we can become fruit bearers for our benefit, for the benefit of those around us, and most importantly, we bring honor and glory to the one that loves us most and gave up his son for us, Jesus Christ. And that is good news. And I'm going to pray. Father in heaven, just we're amazed, uh, amazed that it, it, it what you have set up, it what you have initiated, the plan from the very beginning is that it is all about Jesus. Matter of fact, Jesus, when asking questions about what is eternal life, he says, I am eternal life, being in relationship with him. So Father, help us all to be good branches, 
Help us to stay connected to the vine. Help us to encourage one another. Help us to look to people who are further along the line. Father, help us in situations that are gray, that are rough, that, that, that where we don't know the answers. Father, we thank you in advance for the fruit that you've produced in us where we just become the kind of people that react with kindness and compassion and goodness and gentleness and, and peace and joy. Only you, God. You turn the the toughest things in our lives into our greatest victories and our greatest opportunities to impact other people. You deserve all the glory and honor because you are the king of the universe and the lover of our souls. And we give you all the praise and glory in the name of Jesus, amen. Let's stand up and sing.
Hey, before I uh, give Frankie the chance to say a final thing to you, I wanted to let you guys know something. My dad died a year ago. It was a year ago last uh, Saturday in a car accident. And uh, you go through a lot of emotions when you lose somebody, and certainly unexpectedly. But do you know what? Because I had abided in Christ and stayed with Jesus. I grieved it well. I was sad. I was sorrowful. I was grateful knowing that where he was at, one of my worst moments in life was one of his best moments in life. Right? When he died, it, it was his best time, one of my worst. But that abiding took time to get to where you could understand and, and put your mind around some of the tragedies of life. So I just encourage you to keep holding on to Jesus. Do the things that Herc mentioned. Attend church regularly, a church, a Bible church, a church that teaches you about God. Go to get involved in small groups. Read what you can. Surround yourself with some people that are a little further along the road to say, how, how can I respond like this? And trust that God grows you. And he does. It's a promise. It's one of the greatest things about being coming to Christ follower. He makes all things new and he makes you new. So with that said, I just wanted to say a couple little things. That's what he's doing with Frankie. When we met seven years ago, he was an interpreter with the dream. And it was, the dream was to help people as Jesus helped. In fact, the, their mission statement for their church is, is to help children through education by loving them as Jesus has loved us. That's what their mission statement is. Yeah. And you said, I said, Frankie, where'd you get that? You said there's a Bible verse. What's the Bible verse? Matthew. Matthew 25, verse 36 to 46. What is it, basically? Um, they said, um, Jesus can ask you, you did... Um, For the least of these. Yeah. Jesus can ask you, you uh, when you see me hungry, you don't give me anything to eat. When you see me thirsty, you don't give me something to drink. When you see me unclosed, you don't close me. When you see me in, a, in the prison, you don't come to see me. And you realize you when, whenever you do that for one of the children of mine, it is for me you did it. So that's the vision he had that God has and that you're part of. I would ask him another thing. I said, uh, Frankie, I said, how much does it cost the children to go to your, your school? And he says, we ask the children to pay $1 a week. That's $50 a year. You send your kids to parochial school or private school, elementary, it might run you three, four, five thousand dollars You send them to high school, it might write them ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. He's asking for $50. And you said out of the 160 kids, how many could afford it? 160 kids, about $1,000. One, one, $1 a week for, or five, five yeah. for, and you for, said only, for a month. And only half the kids could afford that, is that right? Yeah. All right, so with that said, you know, you can give 50 bucks, you could give 100 bucks, and you could pay for kids' schooling for the entire year. Frank, I just wanted you to know, our goal was to raise uh, $12,000. We can give $1,000 to him to feed all the kids that we need. Full bellies, full food. And anybody that comes to ask, we can do the same thing. And then to give the teachers a little bit of a pay raise, if we can. And uh, so the first service gave over $6,000, Frankie, just so you know that. Okay, thank so you. So we're, we're there. Yeah. We're And I'm asking you to be generous today as well and to step up and, and uh, whatever we miss, we're going we're gonna to fill it, but uh, we're going to continue to see what God does as we abide in him and trust in him and what he does through Frankie. Frankie, I want to say something to all you guys. I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me. And thank you. God bless you all. Yeah. You know, you see Frankie's clothing. He's going back with about 700 items of Oak Ridge clothing, just so you're aware of that. <laughs> Let's, yeah. let's, let's say a prayer and then we'll get out of here. Just Father, just thank you. We thank you that the sun shines on all people over the face of the earth and that sun is actually your sun. God, we love you. And we thank you that we can be generous. We thank you that we can be kind. We thank you that you forgive us. We thank you that we can be made new. We thank you for your truth and your grace. God, I pray your blessings upon everybody here, everybody watching online. Pray your blessings upon the people of Haiti uh, that you called us to help. God, it's in your mighty name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Next week, part three, God at the movie. See you then.